Good evening. I'm Andre Bukharev. I'm a professor of philosophy here at Marist College. And um, it's my pleasure this evening to introduce uh, two uh, of my favorite thinkers. Um, the first is uh, Sean Carroll, who's the Homewood Professor of uh, Natural Philosophy and Fractal fa Faculty um, at the Santa Fe Institute, and he's, he's professor at Johns Hopkins, I should clarify that. <laughs> and uh, Philip Goff, who's professor of philosophy at uh, Durham University. Both have made significant contributions to their uh, fields. Uh, professor Carroll to work in theoretical physics, as well as to philosophy of physics. And uh, Philip uh, Goff to work in uh, consciousness studies. Um, this debate this evening is part of a larger conference on the question of whether or not consciousness is a fundamental feature of physical reality, of the world. Um, and it's part of a project that uh, I am co-PI with Philip on that is devoted to this question and its intersection with questions about the nature of the divine that is funded by the Templeton Foundation. This, pro this debate this evening also is brought to you by the School of Liberal Arts, who generously have also uh, here at Marist College who have um, helped fund quite a bit of what we've been doing here at the conference. So um, with that, uh, we first, the format of the debate will be, um, Professor Goff will first uh, present, uh, make the case for uh, consciousness being a fundamental feature of uh, the physical universe, and then uh, that'll be followed by uh, Professor Carroll um, making the case for the opposing view, and that'll be followed by rebuttals from both of them and closing remarks from each, and then we'll move to Q&A. Okay, so with that being said, I give you Philip Goff. So. Thank you very much, Andre. Thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, the slides are here. Actually, I. So, okay, I'd like to begin by thanking the Templeton funded Pantheism and Panentheism Project that happens to be run by me and Andre for inviting me here tonight. And I'd like to thank Sean for kindly coming to debate this. We've, Sean and I have debated for about seven hours now on our respective podcasts. This is the first time we've met in person, so I'm hoping tonight's going to be the moment I persuade him, but we'll have to wait and see. Okay, so I want to start with a modest question. How do we find out about reality? How do we go about having our best guess as to what reality out there is like. So I think, I think we should, um, the way to address this is to ask the question, what are the data for a theory of reality? What are the data that any adequate theory of reality has to be able to account for? Now certainly uh, among these are scientific data, the data of public observation and experiments. No question that any adequate theory of reality has to be able to account for scientific data, the data of ob ob observation experiments. I call these public data. But are there any other data for a theory of reality? Another way to ask this question is, is there anything we know to be true about reality independently of science? So I'd like you to, to, all of you to ask yourselves that question right now. Is there anything you know to be true about reality independently of science? And I want to suggest that there is at least one thing, namely the reality of our own feelings and experiences. Our pleasures, our pains, our experiences of color, sound, smell, and taste, and so on. So this is, the, this is not a scientific datum. This is not something we know about from experiments. You can't look inside someone's brain and see their feelings and experiences. Nonetheless, feelings and experiences are real. Uh, we know about them in a quite different way. You know just from your immediate awareness of your own experiences. If you're in pain, you're just directly aware of your pain. So it's not a scientific datum in that sense, but it is real. Uh, pain is real, believe it or not. And so any adequate theory of reality has to be able to account for it. So I call these private data. 
the immediate awareness each of us has of our own feelings and experiences. And I suggest that any adequate theory of reality has to be able to account for both public data and private data. And once you accept this, you come bang up against the ancient conundrum the philosophers call the mind-body problem, which is quite simply the challenge of how, in very general terms, to do this, how to bring together what we know about reality from science, let's call that the physical world, with, what we, with, with the privately known reality of our own feelings and experiences. Let's call that consciousness. How, how to bring these two seemingly very different things, consciousness and the physical world, together in a single unified theory of reality. That's the challenge. So, the mind-body problem. So, rough, roughly speaking, there are three solutions. Physicalism, panpsychism, and Jesus. Well, there are more than three solutions, but I've only got 20 minutes. So, so remember, the challenge is how do, we, how do consciousness and the physical world fit together? One possibility is physicalism. The view that it's a physical world that's fundamental and consciousness emerges from physical processes in the brain. This is the view Sean is inclined to. My own view, panpsychism, turns that on its head. So on this view, certain facts about consciousness are fundamental and the physical facts emerge from underlying facts about consciousness. Third option, dualism, that both consciousness and the physical world are equally fundamental but distinct. Perhaps the best known proponent of this in modern times is David Chalmers, and Chalmers calls himself a naturalistic dualist. So he, he, although he thinks consciousness is not physical, he wants to bring it into the domain of science. And he does this by postulating what he calls psychophysical laws of nature, special laws of nature that connect up the mental and the physical. So even though they're very different, the mental and the physical, they interact in a law-governed way that science can discover. So how does consciousness and the physical world connect up? Physical world is fundamental. Consciousness arises from that. Consciousness is fundamental. Physical world arises from that. Or they're both fundamental. Now, crucially, it's, it is not a scientific question which of these is correct. Each of these views is empirically equivalent, which means you can't distinguish between them with an experiment. So let me spend a little time spelling that out a little bit. Now, of course, experiments are absolutely crucial for dealing with consciousness. We're not going to make progress with consciousness without experiments. But the primary way in which experiments help us with the mind-body problem is in working out which kinds of physical activity in brains go along with human and animal consciousness. So although consciousness is not publicly observable, if you're dealing with a human being, you can ask them what they're feeling and experiencing, and you can scan their brain, and you can try and work out which kinds of brain activity correlate with consciousness. Now, there is no consensus here, but one contemporary candidate is the integrated information theory, which tells us that human and animal consciousness is correlated with maximal integrated information. Now, you don't worry what maximal integrated information is. That is, is, is a property of complex systems that the theory gives a mathematical definition of. But let's, so let's suppose, just for the sake of discussion, that this turned out to be the true theory of how consciousness and brain activity correlate. That would be a really important, crucial bit of scientific information. But it wouldn't settle the mind-body problem. This kind of scientific data is just neutral on all those possibilities on the mind-body problem. Each one will just interpret that data in their own terms. So if you're a physical, so, so we're supposing that the integrated information theory turned out to be true, that consciousness goes along with maximal integrated information. If you're a physicalist, you'll say, all oh, that means consciousness emerges when there's maximal integrated information. If you're a panpsychist, you'll say, well, no, no, that's when complex consciousness emerges from simpler forms of consciousness when there's maximal integrated information. Or if you're a David Chalmers-style dualist, you'll say, well, the psychophysical laws connect up consciousness to maximal integrated information. So all of this scientific data just leaves open these philosophical options on the mind-body problem. 
Okay, so if we can't distinguish between them with an experiment, how do we decide which is correct? Good question. Here's the answer. I propose we apply the following two criteria. One, simplicity. As philosophers and scientists, we, we don't just go for any old theory that accounts for the data. We try to go for the simplest theory, or maybe the most elegant, unified, parsimonious. So that's one criteria. Secondly, explanatory success. Does the theory meet its explanatory obligations? For example, physicalism, I would say, is obliged to explain consciousness in the terms of physical science, whilst panpsychism is obliged to explain the physical world in terms of consciousness, right? So how well do they do on those explanatory obligations? Okay, there's the methodology, there's the criteria. Let's apply it. So firstly, in terms of simplicity, I think this gives the edge to physicalism and panpsychism over dualism. Because both physicalism and panpsychism bottom out in just one kind of stuff. Physicalism bottoms out in uh, physical stuff. Panpsychism bottoms everything out in just consciousness stuff. Both very simple theories. Whereas dualism bottoms out in two kinds of stuff. Physical stuff and consciousness stuff. So all things being equal, we can apply simplicity to rule out dualism. So that leaves, I'm um, you know, obviously simplifying things here. So that leaves us with physicalism and panpsychism. So let's now apply the second criteria of explanatory success to each of these in turn. So starting with physicalism. So as I said, I think this, the central explanatory obligation of physicalism is to explain consciousness in terms of physical science. How well has it done at that explanatory task? Well, despite huge amounts of time and resources, it's got precisely nowhere. And it's not just that we don't have the final story. We haven't managed to explain a single conscious experience in terms of uh, underlying neural firings or brain activity. The hard problem of consciousness has not softened even a little. Moreover, I think there's a very good case that philosophers have put together that this is just not a coherent project. There is precedent for ruling out a popular scientific option because it's incoherent. Galileo ruled out uh, Aristotle's view that was believed for thousands of years that heavier objects fall faster than lighter objects, kind of common sense. And he did that just by, not with an experiment, but just showing when you really think carefully, it just, it's just incoherent, can't be true. I think something like this is true about physicalism, at least physicalism that aspires to explain consciousness. The problem is that there's a kind of conceptual mismatch between the mental and the physical in that physical science works with a purely quantitative vocabulary. Whereas consciousness involves qualities. Just think about your own experience, the smell of coffee, the taste of mint, that deep red you experience as you watch a beautiful setting sun. And these qualities can't be fully articulated in the purely quantitative language of physical science. And that's important because if you wanted to explain why our experiences have the qualities they do, you'd have to be able to articulate those qualities. So, so suppose I have my great neuroscience theory that's going to explain why red experiences have that reddish character that you experience when you look up at that. I'd first have to, my theory would first have to articulate, fully articulate that reddish quality in the purely quantitative language of neuroscience, and then show, account for it in terms of, uh, show how it can be accounted for in terms of patterns of neural firings or what have you. If my theory can't even articulate the explanandum, then it certainly can't explain it. So I think this conceptual mismatch entails the failure of physicalist explanation. That neuroscience cannot fully explain why our experiences have the qualities they do. Now, in fact, actually, what I've just said, there's a fair amount of consensus behind it. In the recent Phil Papers study, uh, survey, rather, of philosophers' opinions, 60% of philosophers 
across the world, Anglophone philosophers at least across the world, um, think that, well, zombies are logically conceivable, which roughly translates as what I'm calling conceptual mismatch here. You know, it's, not, it's not a popularity contest, but when 60% of philosophers think something, this at least gives us pause for thought. And that's why in academic philosophy, the vast majority of physicalists these days have given up, believe it or not, on this project of trying to solve the hard problem, of trying to make intelligible the emergence of consciousness in terms of physical processes in the brain, in the way we've made intelligible the boiling point of water in terms of underlying chemistry. They just concede that that can't be done. And instead, they just postulate, they say, well, we just postulate brute identities between the mental and the physical of a kind we find nowhere else in science. But to my mind, to give up on this explanatory project is, is essentially just to give up on physicalism. You know, if physicalism is true, we'd, we'd expect to be able to explain, to render intelligible the emergence of consciousness in terms of physical brain processes and the way we've rendered intelligible the boiling point of water, at least one day, if not now. And the fact that so many physicalists have just conceded that project doesn't make sense, I think is, it, it is a huge cost to physicalism. And finally, um, just on, on physicalism, I, I don't think we should be surprised that this, this project hasn't, doesn't do very well in terms of explanatory success. You know, I think so many people, and I guess the reason I think physicalism continues to be the most popular option, not by, you know, there's a hel it's a healthy debate, it's 50% versus 30%, and then the others don't like the question or something. Um, but I think it's because people, th you know, uh, people think, look, physical science is brilliant. Look at all the stuff it's done. It's, it's amazing. Of course, it's going to explain consciousness. But we need to explain well, what, what is it been so good at. And I think, you know, what physical science has been good at is accounting for publicly observable behavior. You know, you have a complex system. You account for its behavior by postulating a mechanism, ultimately postulating fundamental laws of physics. That's what physics does well. But when we're explaining consciousness, it's a totally different explanatory project. We're not trying to explain this publicly observable behavior. We're trying to explain these invisible qualities that fill our experience that are not publicly observable but are known by each of us privately. It's just a totally different explanatory project. It's like saying telescopes have been really good in astronomy. Probably they'll be really good in pure math. It's just like a different thing. OK, so in terms of explanatory success, Physicalism does really badly. What about panpsychism in terms of expansionary success? Well, the difference could not be starker. In terms of its central expansionary task, how do we account for the phys physical reality in terms of consciousness? We have already worked out how to do this. We know it can be done. And this is where we go back to the very important work from the 1920s by Bertrand Russell. I think we should think of Russell as the Darwin of consciousness. I think he sort of solved all the mysteries. This got forgotten about for a long time for various historical reasons, recently been rediscovered and causing a revival of interest in panpsychism in academic philosophy departments. So, so the base, I'll just give you the basic idea of this in the remaining time. Um, so Russell, what Russell was doing in the 1920s was thinking very hard about the fact that phys, our fundamental science is purely mathematical which is something we kind of take for granted, but was a, was a radical innovation in the scientific revolution to say, now, from now on, our basic science is just going to be pure math, or maths, as we British say. Uh, I always translate for an American audience, and Americans never translate for a British audience, not for <laughs> American empire. Anyway, um, I forgot what I was talking about now. Uh, but what does it mean? So it's very useful if you're a practicing scientist to have mathematics. You can get very precise predictions. What does it mean as a philosopher interested in the fundamental nature of reality that our fundamental science is just a load of equations? Well, what Russell realized, what it means is our fundamental science, namely physics, isn't telling us very much at all about fundamental reality. It's merely describing its mathematical structure. And so, as far as physics is concerned, fundamental reality could turn out to be anything. The only constraint it imposes is the mathematical structure. So physical re fundamental reality could be anything. As long as it has the right mathematical structure, you're going to be able to get physics out of that. Um, so the, 
contemporary Bertrand Russell-inspired panpsychist exploits this to make sense of their position. So the idea that at the fundamental level of reality, we have networks of very simple uh, conscious entities interacting in simple, predictable ways. Through their interactions, they realize certain patterns, certain mathematical structures. And then the thought is those mathematical structures just are what we call physics. So you get physics out of underlying facts about consciousness. So you can't get consciousness out of physics, but you can get physics out of consciousness. We, we know, I would say, that that can be done. So final, I mean, the poetic way of putting it, the final page of A Brief History of Time, Stephen Hawking said, even a final theory of physics would be just a set of rules and equations and wouldn't tell us what breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe. So for the panpsychist, it's consciousness that breathes fire into the equations. So the difference couldn't be starker. Physicalism, we've never got anywhere with that project. It's arguably a good case that it's incoherent, which is to be expected, I would suggest, given what it's been good at. Uh, panpsychism, we've solved all the mysteries. We, we know how to do this. So what's the verdict? Here's my book, Gratuitous Adverb, my book, Galileo's Error, which <laughs> solves all the mysteries. Uh, so let's compare all the three options on these criteria. In terms of simplicity, panpsychism is superior to dualism. In terms of explanatory success, panpsychism is superior to physicalism. Clear verdict, panpsychism is the best solution to the mind-body problem. Feels a bit weird, but so what? It does the job. So in conclusion, perfect timing. Proud of myself, sorry. Uh, I would say the mind-body problem is a philosophical, not a scientific challenge. In terms of simplicity and explanatory success, panpsychism looks to be the best solution to this philosophical challenge. Therefore, probably consciousness is fundamental. Thank you. All right, is my microphone on? Is that working? So there are people out there, as you've just seen, who think that the difficulties we have in understanding consciousness should lead us to dramatically alter our best picture of physical reality. I think this is a bad idea. And you know, look, maybe it's right. It's certainly possibly right. But just a priori, our understanding of physical reality is incredibly good. Individuals might lack in perfect understanding of physical reality, but as a species, we know an awful lot about it because it's very simple. The rules are remarkably graspable, whereas consciousness would be your first suggestion for something we don't yet understand. It's an emergent phenomenon from 86 billion neurons and the many, many more connections between them. Of course, that's hard to understand. Our lack of perfect understanding about that should not lead us to question our best picture of physical reality. It's like you're doing a math homework, you hand in your math homework and the professor says, you know, I think there's a mathematical mistake here between line three and line four. And you say, well, have you thought about the possibility that the axiomatic foundations of arithmetic are not as solid as you thought they were? <laughs> Maybe, but I do not recommend that as a strategy uh, for trying to improve your grade. This argument goes way back obviously, right? Here's Rene Descartes, the dualist, who uh, thought that mind and body were completely separate things. And here is his nemesis, Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia. He sent the manuscript to Princess Elizabeth. He just wanted money. What he got instead was correspondence saying, this makes no sense. Why? Because you're saying that the mind is completely immaterial, doesn't even have a location in space. So tell me how it interacts with the body. It's not even located anywhere. What, how is it that my mind, which I think makes decisions and gives my body instructions, where does that interaction happen? And Descartes made an attempt. He drew pictures of the pineal gland. You know, Maybe that was the radio receiver in the brain that gets messages from the mind. No one even back then was convinced by this. And of course, so now, People who want the mind to be something other than physical have much more sophisticated and nuanced and delicate versions of this uh, kind of approach that is not purely physical. 
but we have another option now that works much better, namely physicalism. And the trick in physicalism to make sense of consciousness is what is called weak emergence. The idea is that the world appears to us in layers or levels. There are multiple vocabularies, multiple ways of describing the world that work equally well even though they're describing different levels of precision and coarse graining. So you have the, the classic example of a successful application of this comes from the 19th century and the success of thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. We say we have a box of gas, there's some molecules in it. You can speak the language of the molecules. You can use the vocabulary of the microscopic level. And at that level, the words you use are atoms and forces and momenta and collisions, and you can describe what happens inside the box. There's another way of talking about the gas in the box, what you might call the emergent level, where you talk a completely different vocabulary of gases with volume and pressure and temperature and things like that. And these two ways of talking are describing the same thing. They're completely compatible with each other. They're not in conflict in any way. In this very simple example, you could even derive the emergent description from the microscopic one. But what's important is there is some relationship between them. Even if you can't derive it mathematically, maybe you discover it empirically. That's fine. The thing is you're not putting anything new in at the emergent level. You're just saying that's a different way of talking about the same stuff that's going on at the micro level. So a physicalist is going to say the same thing about consciousness. They're going to say there's a very fundamental level where we're all made of quantum fields and there's Hamiltonians and observables and things like that. But we can also step back a little bit and talk about the biological level where there are in our brains neurons and there's chemistry going on. There's connections and signals uh, that go across synapses. That's another perfectly valid way of talking, completely compatible with the underlying quantum field theory description. And then there's a human scale way of talking, where there are agents, right? People with free will. They behave in certain ways, and they also have consciousness. They have impressions. They experience the redness of red. And that entire vocabulary features relationships between these different components. When I'm conscious of the red of the stop sign, I will stop and so forth. And they are completely compatible with the underlying description. It's very important in this whole way of thinking that you not get yourself confused by switching levels in midstream, by saying, you know, I felt pain because the Hamiltonian of the universe had certain operators in it, right? The individual vocabularies are supposed to be up to the task on their own level. You ask a question in one level, you answer it in that one level, and you will not get into trouble. And we have lots of evidence that this basic strategy is on the right track, but let me be very, very quick to admit, I do not know how consciousness works. Whenever I'm up on stages talking about consciousness, number one, it is never my idea, and number two, people always say, why are you up there doing that? You don't know anything about consciousness. So let me reiterate that I don't know anything about consciousness, but I know something about the fundamental nature of reality. So much so that I'm confident that whatever the explanation of consciousness is going to be, someday it will be within that framework. And part of that is because it's not like we're flailing around with nothing to do. If physicalism is true, if that picture I just mapped out for you is on the right track, it's very clear what to do. We have to map out what happens physically in the brain and in the body. Separately, we can map out what happens mentally. We have experiences, we react to them in certain ways, and then we relate them to each other. This is a very successful program so far. This weird looking picture on the top right is actually a picture of my head. I was sitting there in the MEG, the magneto encephalograph, and I was being given stimuli and I was thinking thoughts, and my thoughts were creating little magnetic fields. And these are the observed magnetic fields created by my thoughts, evidence that there are thoughts in my brain, if nothing else. But the point is, this is a very, very primitive example of showing that relationship between a thought you have in your brain and the lower level way of talking about exactly the same thing, the electrochemical processes in the brain. 
And so this whole task of coming up with a way to describe consciousness in these physical terms, we haven't completed it yet or anything like it, but we're very much on the way. And there's plenty of proposals along those directions. It is a, an active and very promising research program. Somehow, not everyone agrees. So there is what I like to call the satisfaction gap, which I think is the real reason people don't like this physicalist approach, because they just don't like the physicalist approach. They don't quite think it scratches the itches that they have. They are not satisfied that this is answering the questions that they are asking. So an alternative that you might want to consider, as Philip just told us, is panpsychism. The idea that consciousness is everywhere. Here's an image of a conscious rock. And mentality is ubiquitous and underlies everything. OK, let's consider this. So there's various arguments that have been put forward in favor of this. I want to hit on some of the classics because I love the classic arguments against physicalism because if you think about them carefully, they all end up being arguments for physicalism. So here is Mary the color scientist, known as the knowledge argument. The idea is philosophers, bless their hearts, will do terrible torture to their thought experiment subjects, but their thought experiments, they don't need to get IRB approval. So Mary the color scientist is locked in a room with no colors in it, and she's taught all the physical facts about the universe. So she's never seen the color red, but she knows every physical fact about red. And then you imagine they finally let her out, and she can see the color red. She experiences it, and we think that she is learning something new. Therefore, the argument goes, there is some kind of knowledge other than the physical facts, right? She knew all the physical facts, but there was something she didn't know, what it was like to experience the color red. Therefore, what its likeness is not physical. It's something called qualia or something like that. Before you get too impressed with this argument, I will ask you to contemplate the phrase, Mary knows every physical fact about the color red. Are you 100% certain that you completely understand what that phrase means? It is very common in this form of argumentation that you use natural language words, and maybe they're a little fuzzy around the edges about what exactly is being conveyed, and you can kind of trick yourself into a conclusion that it's not quite warranted. The right way to analyze this, if you think this is an argument against physicalism, is to say, is there a physicalist explanation for what happens in the thought experiment? And when you put it that way, the answer is, of course there is. It's not even like especially hard. When Mary is learning about color in her black and white room, certain neurons are firing in her brain. When she sees red, different neurons are firing, or in a different pattern they're firing. There are red photons impinging on her retina. That's it, that's the entire explanation. There's absolutely nothing incompatible about physicalism to say that what happens in her brain is different when she sees the color red versus when she reads about the color red in a black and white textbook. It is not, in any sense, a challenge to the physicalist understanding. It gets worse for the anti-physicalists because, like I said at the beginning, we know a lot about the physical underpinnings of the natural world. And here I need to be super duper delicate because this is exactly where there's a very strong impulse to not understand what I'm saying and to misconstrue it. So I'm gonna try to be very careful. I'm not saying that physics is done. I'm not saying we understand everything. I'm not saying we are close to understanding everything and tomorrow we'll figure it all out. I'm not saying any of those things. I'm saying there are some things that we understand and it happens to be that included in the things we understand are all of the physical things going on in this room right now that are relevant to our biology and our thinking and so forth. You and I are made of atoms. And those atoms are made of electrons, protons, and neutrons. There are quarks and gluons in the protons and neutrons. There are forces holding them together, the strong force inside the protons and neutrons, the weak force that can change a neutron into a proton, the electromagnetic force that binds electrons to the nucleus. There is a background Higgs field that gives masses to these particles. And then there's gravity that pulls everything together. We even have an equation that you can fit on a t-shirt. I know this because you can buy the t-shirt on my website. I have the t-shirt, I didn't wear it. I'm not as good a salesperson as Philip is, otherwise I would have shown you the t-shirt. You can look it up. Uh, so the point is, that this is called the core 
theory. Sometimes you get the impression that we understand particle physics but not gravity. It's all there, gravity included in the core theory. And this theory has been, is successful enough to explain every experiment that we've ever done in any laboratory here on Earth. That's pretty good. But it's better even than that. It's not just that we haven't yet seen anything that is in conflict with the core theory. It's that we know if we do eventually see something in conflict with it, which we're very confident that someday we will, but it has to be cleverly hidden. In other words, we have an understanding of the ways in which the core theory can fail within the broad framework of modern quantum field theory physics. There's a little plot, it's too small for you to read, but the point is we have quantitative limits on the kinds of particles and forces that might not yet be observed. And those limits are good enough for us to say they're so weakly interacting with us that they are completely irrelevant for biology, for thinking, for consciousness. So as long as you believe the very broadest principles of modern physics, you and I are made of particles whose behavior we understand. And that is a remarkably impressive achievement. So just to drive it home a little bit, there's some dependence here. I want to emphasize that we don't understand everything. We don't even understand most things. We don't understand biology or chemistry or psychology. Plenty of things we don't understand in astrophysics, not even to mention dark matter and dark energy. And for that matter, there might be a fundamental level that we have no clue about right now. But that's okay, because we know enough to say that what is going on in this room right now depends on and can be described by one certain kind of theory the core theory that we actually do know. So that puts incredibly tight constraints on what can happen in the world. We don't know everything, but we know some things. This amount of knowledge poses a huge dilemma for the panpsychist. So I've written this dilemma in very big letters <laughs> because I don't want anyone to kind of ignore it. Panpsychists, I would say, tend to ignore this dilemma. Philip kind of gestured toward it in his opening talk, but they would rather not address it. And the dilemma itself is very simple. Any specific version of panpsychism or anything that says something other than pure physicalism must choose between saying the core theory is not quite right and we have to change it, or the core theory is fine. I claim, using principles of logic taught to me by Aristotle, that those are the only two choices. Your theory of panpsychism is either changing the behavior that we know about from particle physics, or it's not. Those are the only two choices. If you're ever dating a panpsychist, ask them this question. It's okay if they choose the first option, it's okay if they choose the second option. The only thing not okay is if they refuse to answer and they equivocate and they change the subject. Red flag, swipe left, go on, okay? <laughs> but if they do choose one option or the other, they're still in trouble. They get a second date, but I wouldn't commit too early. So let's say that you say, okay, we will change. We'll bite the bullet. We will change the core theory. You know, good luck with that. I'm not against it. This is what physics is all about. This is what we pay people to do. So you are absolutely encouraged to think about how to change that equation. The way that you would need to change it is to say that electrons, for example, behave differently in a brain than they do in particle physics experiments. That is conceptually possible. It is against everything we believe about quantum field theory and modern physics, but it's a free country. Knock yourself out, believe it. But don't just say that you think it's possible. That's wimpy and that's, that's not fair. Change the equation. Tell me exactly how you were gonna change this equation. What are the terms that kick in when the electron is in a brain rather than in a rock or in a particle accelerator? Do they violate energy conservation? Do they conserve unitarity? Do they obey some dynamical equation? How does the non-locality come in there? I want to know, and I want to know whether it's compatible with all the other experimental evidence we have. And let me give you a hint for the young people in the audience. If you really believed this, you would drop everything right now and devote yourself to finding what those unknown terms are. Because if you correctly come up with the theory that explains how electrons behave differently in brains than at the Large Hadron Collider, you would instantly become the most famous scientist in all of human history. Not only would you win the Nobel Prize, they would quit giving out Nobel Prizes after you won yours. There's no point in giving out any more. 
And yet, there's not a lot of people trying to do this. It makes you wonder whether they are really committed to believing that this is the right way to go. Also, if you did it, Yuri Geller would be very, very happy to think that his brain could go out there and bend the spoon. The other option, of course, I think this is the way Philip leads, but he'll let you know, not changing the core theory. I kind of like this option because then I can stop listening. Then I don't really need to have any interaction with that person anymore. Why should I care if you have you know, this great, great theory and I say, what does it do to my understanding of the physical world? And you'd say, nothing. Okay, well, you know, then maybe I have other ways to spend my time. As it says in the slide, unlike regular people, philosophers don't all think that consciousness affects behavior. This was a startling revelation when it really sank into me. They've invented this idea called the zombie, the philosophical zombie. They say, imagine, because they're trying to be anti-physicalists. They're trying to come up with an argument against physicalism. They say, I bet I can conceive of a creature, maybe not in our world, but maybe in some other possible world, similar to ours but also different, that is exactly the same physically and exactly the same behaviorally as a person, but who does not experience consciousness, does not really have those qualia we talked about, does not really appreciate the redness of red. So I love this argument, it's so good, because if you buy it, you've completely undermined your anti-physicalist case. If you think that zombies are conceivable, you are granting that what you mean by consciousness is something that has no effect whatsoever on human behavior. I think that consciousness has something to do with pain and love and anxiety and things like that, but not the zombie people. They've admitted that can't be true because they could imagine a person that behaved in exactly the same way without consciousness. There would be a zombie Philip Goff who would write books about panpsychism and give impassioned speeches about the primacy of consciousness, but without ever having experienced consciousness. You have to believe that that is possible if you believe that zombies are conceivable, which completely undermines the whole argument that you're trying to make. Why would you believe that consciousness is fundamental? Philip told you because you have private data. You have introspected and you've thought about things. The zombie thought experiment proves, if you think that zombies are conceivable, that such introspection is entirely unreliable because the zombie would swear that it has those inner experiences, but it doesn't. So there's something completely unbelievable. The punchline being that if your theory doesn't account for behavior, then in my world, it doesn't explain consciousness at all. In my world, what I want to explain about consciousness is very, very much tied up with behavior. If consciousness were different, behavior would be different. So if you have a theory that just gives you kind of a warm feeling about consciousness but doesn't actually affect any way in which we act in the world, I become less interested. So the punchline is, physical reality is enough. I absolutely believe that consciousness is a subtle and difficult complex phenomenon. We don't understand much about it yet. I do not think that, well, since we haven't understood it yet, we should dramatically change our picture of the whole universe. It might take decades, centuries, millennia before we fully understand consciousness, but that's completely compatible with everything we know about the physical nature of reality. It's more productive to work within that paradigm. Thank you. Okay, so I guess I mean, there are two, uh, thanks, Sean. There are two aspects to this. One is the case against physicalism that I made that I guess Sean has responded to, and then the other is the plausibility of panpsychism and so on. So let's start with, you know, the case against physicalism. Um, so Sean talked about the knowledge argument and gave his response to that, and I'm sorry, Sean does not get the knowledge argument. I'm sorry to say, if, if a student wrote that on the knowledge argument in an essay, they would not get a great grade. And I, I do not give grades on whether people share my philosophical view. It's about whether they understand the argument. There was actually one philosopher on Twitter who gave sort of pretty much that interpretation of knowledge argument. And the creator of the knowledge argument, Frank Jackson, emailed me to say that is a terrible understanding of this argument. Anyway, so let me just look. The, so as, Sean's understanding of the knowledge argument, right, is... Um, his, <laughs> 
is a uh, screenshot from one of our debates. Sean's understanding of the knowledge argument is, um, seems to be, uh, you know, that we're thinking, how come, how come Mary doesn't have read experiences when she reads all the neuroscience? That's not, I mean, of course, it's because it, she hasn't got the right stuff in her brain. That's, everybody agrees on that. That would be a terrible argument. That's not the point of the argument. The clue is in the name, it's about knowledge. But the, the, the point is, right, here, here's a way of putting the point, not, not quite going into the knowledge argument, but the, as I said, the point is, the core problem with physicalism is that to make intelligible why red experiences have their reddish character, we'd have to be able to articulate that reddish character in the purely quantitative vocabulary of neuroscience. As I said before, so you wanted to, look, I mean, I think physicists should aspire to give the kind of explanation like we have of the boiling point of water in terms of underlying chemistry. Um, and to do that, you'd have to be able, if I, as I said, if you had a sort of neuroscientific theory that explained why red experiences have that reddish quality, you'd have to be able to articulate it. But that implies, and this is the connection sort of to the knowledge argument, I mean, Mary's a bit far-fetched, we don't need to go into all that. That implies that a blind from birth neuroscientist could learn what it's like to see red from reading neuroscience. That, because if you could really convey, it doesn't mean they'd have the experience. Of course they wouldn't have the experience, that's because of what's going on in your brain. But they would totally grasp, understand the reddish quality. Because if it, had been, if it was able to be completely conveyed, in the language of neuroscience, then they could read the neuroscience with Braille and completely grasp that quality. So that, so that is the point, that it's, it, it's an implication of the possibility of giving a physicalist explanation of the qualities of experience. That, that is an implication that a colorblind neuroscience would, scientist could come to see, come to learn what it's like to see red. Um, so basically, here are the options for the physicalist. Um, either you just give up on the aspiration to make intelligible the emergence of consciousness in the way we've done, for example, with the boiling point of water, or you accept that a blind from birth neuroscientist could learn what it's like to see red from reading neuroscience. And the vast majority of physicalist philosoph in philosophy, because of the absurdity of B, now go for A, right? They now sort of... And the, I find this is a difference, actually, but it's an interesting difference between physicalists in philosophy and physicalists in science. Like, physicalists in science think that we should be, like, solving the hard problem, explaining consciousness. And I, I think I get that impression from Sean, not that he's, that's his area, but that's what, whereas the people, physicalists in philosophy have just realized this can't be done. You know, as I say, there's this 60% consensus. This came out actually on this, on the debate we had on my podcast Mind Chat with Barry Lower, where he, he was very much giving up on the side of giving up that, that possibility of giving some kind of intelligible explanation, whereas I think Sean is more on the other side. When I've debated Anil Seth um, and, and a philosopher, Laura Gao, that came out again. So actually, this kind of gives me hope because the majority of physicalists in science get something wrong, something right. And the majority of physicalists in philosophy get something right. The majority of physicalists in science get right that we should be bloody explaining consciousness. Whereas the majority of physicalists in philosophy re have just realized through thinking very carefully about this over decades, it just can't be done. You put those together, you get a case against physicalism. So it's, and again, this is actually the way Sean prints it. You know, this is, the on this is just continuous with science more generally, the reason this can't be done is these are just very different kinds of concept. Uh, the, co the purely quantitative vocabulary employed in physical science, chemistry, neuroscience, and the qualities that characterize our experience. These are just totally different kinds of concept. And so you're not gonna be able to build explanatory bridges between the two. Um, okay, so so I, I, so I don't think we've had a good response at all to the case I've made against physicalism. Uh, okay, so what about panpsychism? Um, so Sean focuses on this, uh, this zombie business. So I think it's, I think it's really cool that, um, I think it's really cool that Sean is using this argument that's usually used against physicalism in support of physicalism. I think that's very interesting. 
Again, I, I just think this is rooted in, in philosophical error and sort of not fully understanding what's going on here. So we know, so this idea that, you know, if, if zombie worlds are possible, consciousness doesn't do anything, that is just a misunderstanding of the view. It's a total non sequitur. We, we know that a single kind of mathematical structure can be realized in very different uh, underlying bases. Just think about hardware and software, right? Um, like Microsoft Word is a bit of software, a bit of computational structure. That could be realized in, in very different things, in your iPhone, on your desktop, on your laptop. It doesn't follow, your iPhone doesn't do anything, right? That would be ridiculous. But for the panpsychist, that is exactly the same relationship that holds between physics and consciousness, right? So physics for the panpsychist is this kind of mathematical structure, computational structure, if you like. That's the software. And that software of physics is, on the panpsychist, you realized in the hardware of consciousness, some consciousness hardware, networks of very simple conscious entities. Uh, there could be other possible universes where the software of physics is realized in some different stuff, some non-consciousness hardware. So what, right? The fact, compare it to the, the fact that Microsoft Word can be realized in both an iPhone and a laptop doesn't mean the iPhone doesn't do anything. Likewise, the fact that the software of physics could be realized in consciousness stuff and non-consciousness stuff doesn't mean the consciousness stuff doesn't do anything. That is just a total non sequitur. That there are lots of good challenges to panpsychism. This is just not one of them. This is just misunderstanding the view. And there's a similar objection, um, Sabine Hossenfelder. Um, well, maybe we don't need to go into this for the sake of time. So I just, I just think that's misunderstanding the view. This, um, and then, so the other point, I suppose, is uh, this, this alleged clash with physics and the core theory. I, I mean, I just think this is, a, this is a total red herring, right? So it is true there are what we call strong emergentist. Uh, so I will answer Sean's question directly, uh, his, his, his panpsychist date question in a moment. It is, but it, just to preamble, it is true that there are strong emergentist forms of panpsychism. That is, forms of panpsychism that would invite some modification of physics. And we discussed some of them this morning at the conference. But there are also what we call weak emergentist forms of panpsychism that, that, that are totally consistent with, that don't require any modification of physics. Um, and it, but, but likewise, with physicalism, there are strong emergentist forms of physicalism. Uh, Kev, the neuroscientist Kevin Mitchell, for example, uh, Lee Cronin and, and, and Sarah Walker, their, their views in chemistry and the, neuroscience and the um, origins of life, imply a kind of strong emergentism, that there are, that not everything that happens is reducible to the basic equations of physics. So with both panpsychism and physicalism, there are, there are forms of it which clash with current physics and forms of it which don't. So this is just an irrelevant question to which is the better theory, panpsychism or physicalism, right? So, so I, the answer to the question is, you know, there are forms of both, just like there are forms of, you know, you could ask the same date question to the physicalist, right? Um, so I don't think this is, the, this is the way to distinguish them. Oh, yeah, I mean, this is where maybe where Hossenfelder points come in. Uh, so Hossenfelder, Sabine Hossenfelder, very interesting thinker, um, had this idea that, oh, she'd heard, of, she said she'd read some pamphlets on panpsychism. I don't know what she was talking about. But anyway, <laughs> she had the, the idea that, um, you know, if particles had these, as well as their physical properties, mass, spin, and charge, had these weird consciousness properties, then they would change their behavior, and that would show up in our physics, and our physics would be wrong. Right? That's just misunderstanding the view. The view is that it's not changing physics necessarily. It's the view that there's more fundamental la layer underneath the physics. And then, you know, so you can leave physics just as it is. There's a more fundamental layer underneath. Um, now, Sean just, I mean, at the end of the day, he just comes back to this. Well, if physics is going to stay the same, I don't care if it's not, you know. And I just think that is revealing, um, that is revealing a sort of scientific commitment that all we care about is experiments. If it's not making a difference to experiments, we don't care about it. But my, my fundamental starting point is there is another data point here. Experiments are absolutely crucial, but there's something else we know about reality independently of experiments. 
the reality of consciousness. You just know for your immediate awareness. And that needs to be fit in as, fitted in as well. That is an important um, project for the, the, the human, the noble human cause of trying to have our best guess at the nature of reality. We need to work out how the reality of consciousness that we know about in one way fits together with scientific knowledge, which we know about in another way. How do they fit together? And we consider these different options, physicalism, materialism, dualism. You're not going to decide it with an experiment. It might not make a difference to experiments, but it needs to be done. The alternative, is, which is what we did for most of the 20th century, is just to pretend consciousness doesn't exist or, you know. And I can understand that, you know, if you're a working scientist and you deal with experiments that seem really tractable and this just seems like, you know, wishy-washy philosophizing. I can understand that, but... There is no alternative. We know consciousness exists. We know the data of experiments exist. We have to find that we can't do an experiment to settle the question, but we have to try and have our best guess. Fortunately, as I've tried to show, when we do compare the theories in terms of simplicity, in terms of expansionary power, there is a clear winner, right? There is one, one theory that has uh, never got anywhere, and there are these serious arguments that is not coherent, and as I said, I don't think Sean has properly addressed those arguments, and there is this other theory that we've managed to work out how it, how it can be done. We, Bertrand Russell, I think, managed to work out how to explain physical reality in terms of underlying facts about consciousness, and I don't think Sean has given a good argument against the coherence and the viability of that. Um, so, I've got a couple of minutes left. So, I mean, I think what's in the background here is, is this commitment to scientism, which we can define as the view that um, the, only, the only things we... Oh, I think I have a slide on this somewhere, actually. The only things... Here's a picture of my new book that's not really to do with what we're talking about, but anyway, <laughs> which, another good show to suffer. Uh, the only things we should believe in are those that can be established through uh, scientific experiments. I think, you know, science is very much the religion of our time, I think, scientism. I think we're going through a period of history that, that people will look back and uh, see as this period of history where people were so blown away by the success of natural science that they were led to think, that's everything, it's the complete truth. Uh, but actually, I, th I would argue that the, the reason natural science has gone so well is because it's focused since the scientific revolution on this very narrow, focused project, namely of accounting for the data of experiments and observations. And that's really important. But there are other things we know about reality, most obviously the reality of our own feelings and experiences, and, and, and they need to be fitted in as well. I think, you know, so I feel like Sean ultimately is just basically saying, physicalism, I mean, I think, I, I hope I've shown that, you know, there aren't sort of pretty good arguments here. I think he just coming back to, physicalism has to be true, it's the scientific option. And I think that's what so many people feel. But that is, that is just not correct. These are uh, both physicalism and panpsychism are able to, have the same predictions, we can't distinguish them with an experiment, both are equally compatible with the scientific data. It's, it's a philosophical choice which of these theories is correct. And I think once you properly analyze that and uh, think of it in those terms, then the inadequacies of the physicalist position just become quite clear, and as does the potential of panpsychism to explain both the quantitative data of physical science and the qualitative reality of human consciousness. That's really the, the attraction of the position. So, so yes, I don't think we've heard, we've heard a, a response, really, to the, um, the case against physicalism. I don't think we've heard uh, a good objection to the coherence and the plausibility of panpsychism. So I maintain we should still accept that panpsychism is the best solution to the mind-body problem and that... What's the title of this debate again? Consciousness is probably fundamental. Thank you again. I'm just going to leave this up there. That's how nice I am. That is how... Uh, oh, sorry, what, that wasn't deliberate. What a good friend I am. But I, I did feel weird to hear Philip say that he thought that I got up here and said, physicalism just must be true because it's true and that's what scientific w methods tell us is true. I don't think that I said that. I tried to provide arguments for why it is the best way forward, the most promising way forward. Let's be honest. So 
I know it's a debate, but from now on, I'm actually going to try to move forward. I don't care about winning the debate. I don't care whether you vote for me at the end or not. I want to try to have everyone in the room come to the best possible understanding of why I believe what I believe, why Philip believes what he believes. And I do think that we should be open to the possibility that consciousness is fundamental and so forth. I don't think that we know. I'm trying to judge credences and balance them against each other. When it comes to future knowledge about science, about psychology, about philosophy or whatever, we judge things, right? We don't know what the right answer is. We have feelings that this is more promising, this is less promising, and so forth. In my mind, sticking with our incredibly successful picture of the physical world as central and fundamental is by far the best way to bet about future progress. But of course, we could be wrong. I just want you to understand why I think it's the best way to bet. So just to go through some points very quickly, let's go to the fundamental dilemma that I said. Is your version of panpsychism going to change the fundamental physics as we know it, the core theory, or is it not going to change? I think, correct, so correct me if I'm wrong. Did you give us an answer? Um, I'll take that as a no. <laughs> he kind of wiggled a little bit, kind of like, you know, said, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. I, I think that's not okay, personally. I'm, I'm, being a panpsychist is perfectly okay. But to be a principal panpsychist, you got to tell me whether your version of panpsychism changes physics as we know it or doesn't. That's not a minor footnote thing. That's a central, hugely important thing because all of the explanatory framework is completely different depending on those two choices. Philip mentioned that there are even physicists who think that we can have strong emergence, violate the core theory, et cetera. Yeah, they're wrong too. <laughs> That's not a challenge to me. They're com also completely absent of like evidence that the core theory can be violated or an alternative to it. I would give exactly the same talk against them. To say that there are people who share my wrong idea is not necessarily an argument for it unless you explain why. And again, it's the same kind of thing. It's a challenge to understanding the nature of life, the nature of evolution. These are all very hard things. They are exactly where you would expect us not to understand everything perfectly. They are where we should have the least confidence in drawing sweeping conclusions about the fundamental nature of reality. So to move on quickly to some of the other points, the knowledge argument, again, I, I, we'll, you'll play the tape. You will watch the debate. Philip comes up and says, I have given a terrible misstatement of the knowledge argument. He would give me a bad grade. And then he paraphrases the argument that he thinks I gave that bore no relationship to the argument that is actually on my slide. So you should see the argument on my slide. And then he never actually gives the correct argument. He changes it to one about a blind neuroscientist, which is fine. I'm happy to deal with that also. He completely missed the point of my argument which is that there is nothing in this thought experiment that a physicalist cannot entirely account for. No physicalist would claim that just because the nature of reality is fundamentally physical, that you can experience the redness of red by learning physical facts about red. Why would anyone ever think that? Why would anyone ever think that a blind neuroscientist could experience the redness of red by learning about red? That's not entailed by physicalism in any way. The neurons that fire in your brain, as I tried to say very explicitly, are different when you're learning facts about red than when you're seeing red. That's a very down-to-earth physical thing. It's just completely orthogonal to whether or not physicalism is correct. But consistent with my desire here to be uh, um, substantive and push things forward, it does raise a really interesting question here. And this is at the heart of my disagreement with Philip, which is, what does it mean to explain something? Philip told us, and I, I, because I had a pre-prepared set of slides, I let this go in, in my own talk. Philip got up here and unembarrassedly said that panpsychism has completely explained why we have conscious experiences. Is that fair? I don't want to misquote you. No, I said it's explained, it's been explained. It's it has explained. <laughs> It has explained what? Physical reality in terms of consciousness. But has it explained consciousness? It's explained consciousness, 
Okay, so here is where we disagree. When I think of consciousness, I think of something that is in inextricably intertwined with who I am as a person, both what I'm privately thinking and how I act, how I behave. It is part of that emergent description. I'm conscious of something. I've, I'm conscious that this person was talking about me behind my back. Now I'm mad at them, right? If I didn't know about it, I wouldn't be conscious. I would act differently. It's all part of a, sta of a tapestry that is pulled together. And to say that, okay, I'm going to posit that consciousness is fundamental improves my understanding of that not at all. I don't see how I have any better understanding of what I am experiencing when I see red just by saying, well, redness, the experience of conscious redness is fundamental. I don't see what is gained. I don't see the explicit path from positing consciousness as fundamental to saying I therefore explained something. Philip wants to say that in the explanatory uh, scorecard, panpsychism comes out well ahead. I, I honestly do not see what has been explained by this. I have Googled how does panpsychism explain consciousness. Philip wrote a paper with basically that title. I have read the paper. I still don't know. It does give you a warm feeling to say consciousness is at the heart of it all, but I want to understand why I am conscious of certain things in certain circumstances, how I express that, how it affects how I behave, and none of that is helped in my mind by saying that consciousness is fundamental. So Philip believes that there is an in principle barrier to physicalism explaining conscious experiences. And it has to do with, for example, it's not the only thing, but it has to do with quantitative versus qualitative, right? It's very funny if you read our, if you listen to our first podcast together, uh, Philip wrote a book that he advertised here called Galileo's Error. And the error was saying that our best understanding of reality should be mathematical. And I, I kept defending Galileo and Philip kept trying to argue, you know, Galileo would actually be on my side. And I say, dude, if you title your book Galileo's Error, you don't get to say that Galileo would be on your side. I'm sorry about that. The history of Galileo is not what's relevant. This, the idea that is relevant is the claim that somehow the capacity of science in the modern world is only to explain quantitative things. Philip also said a whole bunch of other things about science that were alien to my experience and understanding of science. I think that the data that we have from thinking about things, from experiencing them, are 100% part of science. I think that science is just about all the data that we have, private or public. It's about getting the best possible understanding that is compatible with all the data we have and judging the possible understandings empirically rather than just by armchair theorizing. So, I mean, what, what can I say? Do those private data affect our behavior? I think that they do. In science, we see over and over again cases where there are individual parts of a theory that you can't specifically see. I've written whole books about the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, where I think that every time a, an atom uh, nucleus decays, a whole new universe is created that we will never see. I'm 100% comfortable with things that we can never see or experience being part of a scientific theory. Why? because they play an explanatory role. I cannot, and, and this is an honest effort on my part, I cannot see the explanatory advantage. I see the warm and fuzzy feeling that if you say, well, consciousness is fo foremost, it's fundamental, that's why I experience the redness of red. But if I really dig into those words, I cannot quite see where the redness is coming from. Whereas I tried to say exactly what I mean by that explanatory move. There is a way of talking about the universe in terms of quarks and leptons, another way of talking about it in terms of neurons and synapses, and another way of talking about it in terms of agents and conscious experiences and so forth, and they all need to be compatible with each other. And as science goes forward and neuroscience and cognitive science advance and philosophy and psychology advance, we will see a relationship between those things. We don't need to see it to understand consciousness. We could understand consciousness purely at the level of humans and their experiences and how they behave. But we're more ambitious than that. We would like to map them onto states of the brain doing different things. I simply express a uh, optimism that that's going to happen. 
But the real question that I honestly don't know how to adjudicate is, does that count as an explanation? If we had a 100% perfectly reliable map that said, when the brain is doing this, you are experiencing this conscious experience. If we had that, we don't, might take a long time, but if we had that, and we knew all the dynamics, we knew exactly how that brain state related to behavior and other brain states and predicted the future and had the perfect scientific theory, here's the question. Does that count as explaining consciousness? And the big difference between me and Philip is, I think, yes, I think you're done. And Philip says, no, there's something inner that is, that is being missed there, something subjective, something what it is like that is not quite accounted for by that. And I honestly don't know how to overcome that difference. It comes down to, you know, what you want out of a scientific theory. But it, it kind of is a cheat to say that it wouldn't count because, I mean, how do you argue against it? How do you say, well, you know, I have explained consciousness and someone says, no, you haven't, not until you have fulfilled this criteria that I invented and I'm not going to be satisfied otherwise. Um, so yeah, so if we, if we want to explain consciousness, if we want to claim victory at the end of the day, right? Uh, it is not clear to me what counts as doing that. When you talk about the qualitative behaviors, the qualitative aspects of consciousness, I think the qualitative behaviors are 100% compatible with science. Science can talk about that. I don't, I don't think that that, I, maybe Galileo did say something. The burden that I work under as a scientist is that scientists, who are some of my best friends, often say slightly sloppy things, often are slightly imprecise, often are a little bit overly enthusiastic. Confession, philosophers also do things like that. So forget about what Galileo actually said. Science is about understanding how the world works at some fundamental level. I would say if we understand everything there is to be understood about the behavior of the world, then we're done. And so I think that when it comes to things like the hard problem of consciousness, right? What is going on with these purely subjective inner experiences? David Chalmers says the easy problems are the behavioral ones, you know, the connection between perceptions and actions. If you want to know to a physicalist how will the hard problem be solved, I don't think the hard problem will be solved. I think it will just dissolve away. As we get better and better at saying, oh, when this person is having this conscious experience, that means that this was going on in their brain. And when we get better and better at that, we'll just stop worrying about the hard problem. The last thing very, very quickly, because I forgot, I should have said this earlier, but Philip brings up a very nice point about the zombie question. He says, you know, it matters whether you have an iPhone or an Android, even if it's running the same software. That is an analogy. <laughs> I just don't think it's a relevant analogy to this particular problem. When the analogy is between saying that the universe is fundamentally conscious or mental versus saying the universe is fundamentally physical, I am still lacking a reason why in that case it matters. An analogy is not good enough to me. If the behavior of all the physical world is exactly the same in those two pictures, I want to know why it matters. In what sense can I claim that one picture explains more than the other if they predict exactly the same actions and behavior in the physical world? And again, I'm, I'm trying to be honest here. I would really like to know. We have, I think, five minutes left in which we're going to learn. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sean. Oh, so much to cover, so much to cover in five minutes. Um, all right, back to the knowledge argument. Uh, you know, Sean says I misunderstood his view, but I mean, so what he said, just as he came up now, maybe I'm not quite quoting this, was, but why would anyone think that a neuroscience, neuro, a blind neuroscientist reading the neuroscience would come to experience red. Why would anyone think that? Why is that a good objection against physicalism? It's not the argument. That is, but that is not the knowledge argument. I went on to talk about a different argument because it's maybe a bit simpler to see the point. The point is, let me tell you the point of the knowledge argument. If materialism is true, if, if Mary has the complete neuroscientific story of color experience, she should have all the relevant information. She shouldn't be able to learn something new 
about the essential nature of color experience. It's about knowledge. It's not about like, how can I explain how Mary doesn't can't experience it? Of course, that's about what's in her brain. That's not the point of the argument. It's about knowledge. She ought to have all the information. Like compared to if you have, suppose you have the complete and final theory of black holes. You shouldn't be able to learn anything new about the essential nature of black holes, because you've got the complete theory. If you learn something new, you didn't have the complete theory. The point is, Mary does go on to learn something new, what it's like to see red. That is a new fact, a new bit of information. She might be curious. She might, I wonder what it's like to see red. Ah, that's what it's like. She, her curiosity is satisfied. She learns some new information. Therefore, she didn't have all the information. Therefore, the neuroscientific story wasn't complete and, can, and can't be complete, given it's, it was supposed to be the complete one. So Sean has to tell us, he has to engage with that. It's about she ought to have had all the information, and yet she learns new information. And he, every time he talks about the knowledge argument, he says, this is a stupid argument. The one he gives is a stupid argument, but it's not the knowledge argument. Um, and this, you know, this links to the point of Galileo, but maybe I won't have much time to talk about this. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of interesting, actually, because I'm realizing, yeah, I, I don't think he, I have, maybe I, he has quite got the, the point, what is supposed to be the explanatory advantage of panpsychism. The explanatory advantage and what has been completed is that we know how physical reality, this Bertrand Russell explanation, could be accounted for in terms of underlying facts about consciousness. And you could make it really precise with Ramsey sentences and things, a certain logical construction. We know that can be done. And so we know this way we could get a, a theory of reality that bottoms out in one kind of stuff, consciousness. We could account for the reality of consciousness and the reality of physics just in one kind of stuff. Just, so just as the materialist aspires to account for uh, everything just in terms of physics, the panpsychist aims to account for everything in terms of consciousness stuff, and we know that can be done. So it's not so much about explaining consciousness. It's about explaining physical reality in terms of consciousness. That's what we know how to do. Um, Sean talked about um, um, that I'm mischaracterizing science because I'm saying science doesn't deal with unobservables. Of course, of course it does. Fundamental particles, other universes, of course it does. But there's a, a crucial difference when it comes to consciousness. In the unique case of consciousness, the thing we are trying to explain is not publicly observable, right? In all these other cases of many worlds and so on, we postulate things we can't observe in order to explain what is publicly observable. In the unique case of consciousness, what we are trying to explain is this thing that's not observed, publicly observable, it's privately known. And so this keeps coming back to Charles saying, what, what do we gain from this? What do we, is it a warm, fuzzy feeling? Is it, on, is it you know, what we gain is, an exp is, is a way of bringing together these two things we know to be real. And I think Sean just can't, you know, if it's not telling me about experiments, what's, what's, what's the point? There are these two things we know to be real, and we need a theory of reality that can bring them both together either by putting consciousness first, and then physical reality pops out, putting physics first, consciousness pops out, getting them both basic. One of those options works really well in the, in, in the way I attempted to explain. So that's what we're trying to do. Yes, so that's why I think just getting the complete neuroscience of the causal role of consciousness and so on, it wouldn't be enough, because we still haven't answered that question. How do consciousness in the physical world, consciousness that we know about in one way, physical reality we know about another, how do they fit together? That is a, a question, it's not a scientific question, but it's a genuine question we need to answer. I have to come back, I'll just take one, one more minute if that's all right. Um, so coming back to this question, did we get an answer to, does it change the core theory? Some questions are not legitimate, there's the famous example, have you stopped feeding your wife? You know, <laughs> you shouldn't say yes. Or, the, the correct answer is, there are forms of panpsychism that are inconsistent with the core theory, there are forms that aren't, just as there are forms of physicalism that are inconsistent with the core theory and forms that aren't. So this is just not a relevant difference in assessing which is the best theory. Um, finally, I, uh, I'd like to end on, yeah, on a positive note. So, I, I, so my, I think we need to move to away from this scientific position to what I call liberal naturalism, the view that our task 
is to account for both what we know through experiments, but also what we know in other ways, such as the privately known reality of consciousness. I'm kind of hopeful we will one day get there. We will get out of this scientific phase of history. If you take a slightly broader look at the, um, our relationship with consciousness, things have actually changed pretty quickly. For a lot of the 20th century, consciousness was sort of a taboo topic, not seen as serious subject matter for serious science or philosophy. Since the 1990s, we do take very seriously this task to explain consciousness, to fit it into reality. But I think for too long, people thought of it as, you know, it's just another scientific challenge. We'll just do more neuroscience and we'll crack it. What people are starting to understand now is the philosophical underpinnings of the problem. That what we have at the core with the mind-body problem is a, is a philosophical, not a scientific challenge. And once you do that, I think you're opened up to just looking at these theories on their own terms, uh, in terms of their explanatory potential, in terms of their simplicity and unity. And I believe when you do that, for the reasons I've explained, there's a clear winner. And I don't think, with all due respect, should really engage with that argument I gave comparing the options. So in conclusion, um, I am hopeful that it, at some point we're going to come out of this scientific theory phase of reality and will be opened up to theories of reality that I think are a little, both a little bit more likely to be true and also perhaps a little bit better for our mental and spiritual health. That's all I've got to say. Thank you for listening. Sorry, I went two and a half minutes over. Despite my previous protestations, I'm just going to put up what I showed you about Mary the color scientist, and then I'm going to let you decide whether there is any daylight between what Philip says is the correct argument and what I said the argument was on the slide. Contemplate that as I talk. Um, a few years ago, I, I had the privilege of appearing as a guest on Science Friday. Listen to Science Friday with Ira Plato, NPR show about science. So Ira is asking me in my role as a cosmologist, he said, you know, cosmologists, they only understand 5% of the universe, right? Only 5% of the universe is ordinary matter that we know about. There's supposed to be 25% that is dark matter, 70% that is something called dark energy. Like, aren't you embarrassed, said Ira Plato, that you only understand 5% of the universe? And my answer was, 5% of the universe we understand. That's amazing. You know, 100 years ago, we understood a fraction of 1% of the universe. It is constantly amazing to me how much progress we have made as scientists, as thinkers, as scholars, in understanding our universe. Because we are tiny, right? If you think about the lifespan of a human being, it's nothing compared to the universe, the physical size of a human being. The lifespan of the human race, as uh, people who could talk to each other, is very tiny compared to the lifespan of the universe, but we figured out an enormous amount. We know what the universe was doing one second after the Big Bang. We have a theory that predicts it, we can compare it to the data, it works. Why am I telling you this? Because this task is hard. This task of trying to understand the universe at a fundamental level is incredibly difficult. When we try to extrapolate beyond what we know, I have close personal friends who believe in hidden variable theories of quantum mechanics. Some of them believe in purely epistemic theories of quantum mechanics. We remain friends despite these egregious errors on their parts <laughs> because I get it. I get why you'd be driven to have this different point of view because we don't know the answer and all we can do is the best we can given what seems to have worked so far for us, given our priorities about what's a good theory, what's a less good theory, things like that. And these are judgments that will necessarily be different from person to person, all of which is prelude to saying, when it comes to understanding either consciousness or the fundamental nature of reality, there's a whole bunch of room for differing about what we're going to eventually land on. Let's imagine that a 1,000 years from now, everyone agrees, oh yeah, the fundamental nature of reality, purely physical or purely conscious, whatever it is. We don't know that yet, and it's there, it is not completely, let's put it this way. 
we can't just say that a certain claim about that is right or wrong. We can say that it looks promising or less promising. So debates like this are worth having. The, the important, helpful role of debates like this, I, I think, is to really highlight and bring out into the open some of the implicit assumptions that we make when we're undergoing this project. What counts to us as a success, right? Here's an, another example that is very current in, in the circles that I hang out in. What are the laws of physics? Not what are they specifically, but what is the nature of a law of physics? There's something called Humeanism that says what exists is the world. Right? The world exists, there's different things happening at different points in space and time. The laws of physics are just a convenient summary of what happens in the world. That's one view. There's another view, anti-humanism, which says the laws of physics exist separately from the world. They bring the world into existence. They have, a, they have an oomph, they play a role in creating the world, okay? Now, I'm a human, but I get why the anti-humans have the view they do because I think that deep down what they're thinking is, and it's perfectly rational to think this, if the universe could just be anything from moment to moment, if the laws of physics are just a description of the universe, rather than something that constrains the universe actively, why is the universe so simple? Why does it obey laws at all? Why does it follow these patterns that we're able to discover? And you know what? Excellent questions. The problem I have is that trying to answer them by saying, so I think the laws of physics are real oomphy things, to me adds nothing. It doesn't give me any more explanation of anything. I say, here is the world, it obeys the laws of physics. You say, here is the world, and there's separately these laws of physics. What have I gained? And that's how I feel about attempts to explain consciousness as fundamental to the world. If you have changed the physics that we know, then that's great. I mean, again, good luck to you. I don't think it'll work. But if you could do that, you're playing by the rules. You have a good theory. We can think about its empirical consequences. I love it. If you don't, I'm not sure what you've gained. If you think like, oh, but now I understand the redness of red and what that experience means, I'm not sure why it's improved. And that's a personal difference between me and the people on the other side. And you get to decide for yourself. Uh, their, their judgments about what will be fruitful going forward, and the only way to do it is to solve aging so that we're around a thousand years from now and can find out what the right answer is. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, I'm, I'm uh, Nic Nic Nicolas from Germany. Hi. Um, so thank you for your amazing performance of both of you. I think it was a lot of passion and a lot of amazing arguments. And, oh, yeah, I, I think it was an amazing performance. And I mean, not just performance, like you really felt what, we, what you were fighting for something which you believe in, I think, which is somehow important for you. And I think importance is, is what I want to talk about. Um, so I agree with you that consciousness does not change the physical laws. Um, but imagine, so you, you would be in a room, right? And um, imagine you would be blind. Um, then you would lose your sense of touch. Um, then you, if, 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 in, in the sen if there would have been another person in the room, maybe, which you could now still hear, you would also lose your sense of like hearing. So then what lessons are left? You can still smell, right? Let's take this away as well. Mm. And maybe I take away something like, you know, feeling happy or feeling sad, I take this away as well, and then what is left? Like, you know, this is... So the, the physical world might still be there, but um, it's, it's not of value anymore, right? Like, if, if, if you really believe in the many world theory, then there are worlds in which really terrible things happen, and there are worlds in which very, very beautiful things happen, and you know, there's a difference, and this is exactly what I've been trying to sh show with this experiment, when you just lose everything, there's... So, yeah, so, was there a question? I'm sorry, I, did, I didn't... You want me to comment on this thought experiment? Uh, you said consciousness doesn't change anything in, in your behavior, right? And I'm, ah, I'm, no, I, sorry, good. I, 
I think that it's... I think consciousness has a huge change in behavior. I do not think that... Effect on behavior. I do not think that zombies, that is to say, creatures that are physically exactly the same as ordinary humans and behave exactly the same way down to the individual atoms, are conceivable. To me, if you had a physically identical copy of atoms doing exactly the same thing that I'm doing, it's just as conscious as I am. Because what I mean by consciousness is a concept that appears on the human level that I would use to describe what's going on. Now, there is an interesting thought experiment. Maybe this is what you were getting at. Uh, Annika Harris this morning gave a talk that you know, raised the question of what if, there, what if we're talking about patients that are locked in? Right, patients that are paralyzed and they cannot talk, but we can figure out, you know, brain scans and whatever. That in many ways, the, well, let me, let me just go. So, so these, in many ways, their brains are behaving the same way that those of a conscious person would. So it is natural to attribute consciousness to them. But if we only had external data and we didn't know about consciousness, we wouldn't discover it that way. I think that's true, and I, you know, I, I kind of say that would be too bad. Uh, but it would, you know, it doesn't change whether it's there or not, and it doesn't change the fact that in the real world, uh, we are lucky enough to have a world where consciousness manifests itself and how it affects other things. So if you take things away, that's great. But in the real world that I'm trying to account for, I think that physics and consciousness play very well together. Hi, uh, my name is Sophia. I'm a philosopher at uh, Vassar College. So my question is actually maybe not on the core of your debate, but I'm wondering about um, especially what uh, Philip Goff thinks about this, but um, question's open. <laughs> so I'm, I'm wondering about the status of the introspective data part right here, the, the first person experience that we know about. Um, and my question is around um, so like there's this principle called the anti-reflexivity principle that is something that's accepted in a lot of South Asian philosophy, like the kind of places that you think people would take panpsychism very seriously and had been taking it very seriously as an option for a long time. I'm not saying that everybody in those traditions agrees with it, but, but it seems like, so the anti-reflexivity principle says, um, and I cannot observe itself, right? And so similarly, consciousness cannot observe itself. Um, so in a lot of those uh, schools of thought, not, not all of them, but uh, the, the thought is that actually, if you know about consciousness, you don't know about it as kind of a perceptual fact or like directly, you know about it through inference, right? Um, so the status of the data in that case is very different from what you would kind of hope <laughs> as a philosopher, right? I, I talk about a lot of these arguments too. So like um, sometimes we talk as if introspective information is just like perceived and there are philosophers who argue for that view but I just want you to say more about about that and um, it gets a little more complicated but also tangentially how to connect that thing <laughs> to whatever's supposed to be happening at the fundamental level which is presumably very different however we know about that epistemically it's like an additional layer right so yeah, thank you. That's a really interesting question, interesting, you know, potential objection to my view. I suppose I think, I think we are able to reflect, as human beings, we're able to reflectively attend to our experiences. Like, you know, you're in pain, you can attend to your pain and think about how it feels. And I think when you do that, you have a kind of rich grasp of it, you know, the, the qualitative character of a red experience, the, how the pain feels and so on. I don't say you get everything totally right, but you, you have a rich understanding of it. And that lead, yields the datum I think we need explained. Why? Why do exper red experiences have this reddish character we're aware of when we attend to our experiences? And that's the sort of datum that's not a sort of datum from experiments, but it's something real we want an explanation of. Um, um, so, I think human beings can attend to their experiences. I think maybe simpler conscious creatures maybe can't have experiences, but can't maybe reflectively attend to them in the same way. Um, I talk about this a little more detail in my academic book, Consciousness and Fundamental Reality. I, so I see it's a good challenge. What, you know, how can the eye see itself? You know, and there might be a challenge to that view 
th there is some data we can get at here. But I suppose I'd want to hear, I guess I just want to hear more about, I mean, that's a sort of metaphor, isn't it, the icons here? So spelling out that into a bit more of an argument about why all knowledge of conference, con consciousness sorry, is inferential. I guess I would dispute that, but maybe we'd have to get into a detailed argument. Um, what was, it, was the, the final point was... Um, um, yeah, so what's going on the fundamental? So that would be an inference, right? Just considering these different theories. Does reality bottom, this, this is the question, does reality bottom out in physics? Does reality bottom out in consciousness? Or does reality bottom out in both? That's a, that's a to my mind, a theoretical question we have to assess on terms of explanatory power, explanatory success, uh, simplicity, and so on. So that's a theoretical question. And I'm not saying particles can attend to their experiences. I don't think necessarily rabbits can either. But we attend to our experiences to get the data of consciousness, and then it's a theoretical question how it all fits together. Hello? Oh, right, cool. Uh, yeah, so first off, you guys were both awesome, so that, that was really fun oh, and uh, entertaining. Uh, and you're both very funny. <laughs> okay. Were we, were we both awesome, you think? Sorry? <laughs> were we both awesome, do you think? Uh, really awesome? Well, so I think, I think um, Let's talk about it later. Okay. We'll talk about it. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry if I got a bit too intense. <laughs> I think you both did. My it was blood great. Pressure. Okay. Uh, all right. So compliments aside. Um, so this one's for you, Sean. Uh, so I, I think I want to talk about the Mary thing, and I want to touch upon uh, what what you seem to think that uh, Philip doesn't find satisfying that you find totally satisfying. So uh, no offense. I think Philip is right. You don't understand the Mary's room uh, argument the knowledge argument. So I want to I want to give you a different one. Uh, I think I think it was a huge mistake that Jackson's Mary was the one that took off. I find Jackson's Fred far more interesting, uh, which is the other character in his paper. So Fred, uh, where we all see just the color red, Fred sees two entirely different colors, right? And we can like test for this empirically, right? So we'll put Fred in a room, give him a sack of like apples or whatever that we can't distinguish very well, and Fred will distinguish them perfectly into you know, two piles each and every time, right? Uh, so we have all this reason to think that Fred sees two different colors, and he tells us, yeah, yeah, the colors that I see here are as different uh, as like yellow and purple are, right? So he sees all the other colors that we see as well. Um, okay, so we can do a bunch of neuroscience, right? And we can actually find out, oh, look, Fred has like an additional cone that the rest of us don't have in his eyes, and he's got some extra neurons that take care of that processing. There are all of these differences, right? Now, you had mentioned, here's something that makes for a satisfying explanation. If I can find the one-to-one -one relation, right? So, like, when you see green, this lights up. When you feel pain, that lights up, so on and so forth. What more could I possibly want? Well, here's what I want. What the hell does Fred see, right? So, and, and we, we have Freds, right? So we have the uh, praying mantis uh, shrimp or whatever, right? Um, that, like, have however many different cones in their eyes and we suspect can see however many different colors, right? There's something that seems to be left out of the explanation. Right? When we say, okay, well, here's the entire neurological story for what's going on inside of the, you know, the mantis shrimp, where I still have no idea what the world looks like to a mantis shrimp, and I never will, right? And I still have no idea what the hell Fred sees when he sees the two bundles of apples, right? And there's nothing, and this doesn't show us that physics is false. It kind of, if anything, I take it that Philip's point is, there's just something missing. All right, sorry, I, I won't take up any more time. So very quickly, the, just so you know, the mantis shrimp thing turns out to be a little exaggerated scientifically, if you, if you, just so you know. Um, but forget about what Fred sees. Wh what do you see when you see red? Yeah, tell me what you see when you see red. Well, Fred could say things like that. There's no difference. What we really mean, so I, I don't see what kind of answer one could hope for in panpsychism or physicalism or anything else to a question like, what do you see, what do you experience when you see red, other than relational answers like, oh, it's warm or it's angry or it makes me feel this or I associate it with that or I act in a certain way. I think that's what it means. And you can give that answer for Fred and Mary and anyone else. I'm not, so I honestly don't know what else you could possibly give in any, I don't, I don't think the burden proof is on me. <laughs> yeah. And, and, it's to, and some people will find that unsatisfying, thus the satisfaction gap. 
You'd think, if, 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 if Sean's response to knowledge argument was so easy, you'd wonder why all these physicalist philosophers have gone to these extraordinary lengths to try and respond to it. Um, but, yeah. I you think, would, you I would think, also wonder why Frank Jackson changed his mind later. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it's like a totally, yeah. you know, it's, we can, resp there are good responses, but your response is, is it's not that easy. <laughs> as, as Frank Jackson himself says, right? It's, I, I think that the problem, I'm going back to your slide, I think the, the misunderstanding was in that what, what you put as the conclusion for the argument. But anyway, maybe, sorry. We could go on forever, couldn't we? <laughs> There we go. Okay, um, so I'm not necessarily on one side or the other. I'm kind of new to this whole philosophy thing. But um, as a neutral party, I guess my question is, um, as a physicalist, uh, Sean, does that mean, like, fundamentally that you have to be an atheist? It's a good question. I mean, as a matter of empirical fact, there are physicalists who would say they are not atheists. But it comes down to what do you mean by God? Right? If you could define God as the universe, as Spinoza did, etc., then maybe you say you're not an atheist. But, I, you know, if it walks like an atheist and talks like an atheist, I might want to <laughs> say that it's an atheist. Yes. <laughs> Where did we end? Let's keep talking. Hello. Um, thank you both for your uh, minds and thoughts. Um, you're both very, very uh, convincing on both sides. Um, but my question uh, is in relation to the zombie argument, um, and either one of you can respond. Um, is consciousness dependent on the satisfaction of the psyche? So you have us beings as consciousness, we have actions, things like that. And it goes into our thought processes, um, but can that correlate with zombies if they have no thoughts or just one thought, if that makes sense? Mm. I can go first, yeah. So I think that you're putting your finger on something which helps illustrate why the zombie argument has been so powerful, because people don't really believe it. <laughs> people don't really believe, and they'll say they can conceive of zombies, but you know, they, you know, the pictures of zombies look different. Their arms are falling off and they're eating brains. And you know, I think that when people say, I have a, a creature that is hypothetical, that behaves exactly the same way as a human being, but doesn't experience qualia or doesn't experience consciousness, in their mind, they're thinking of something that is like a Vulcan or like that doesn't have any affect, right? Or it doesn't you know, feel strong emotions or so forth. That's not the zombie. The zombie behaves in exactly the same way. The zombie proclaims its love. The zombie writes poets, poetry. The zombie cries at the at Wally. Uh, the zombie does all, everything that a human being would do, and that's the challenge, I think, to the non-physicalists. Like maybe you think that they're not conceivable. That's fine. But the first step of the argument is, I think they are conceivable. And if they are conceivable, then you're admitting that your version of consciousness is not playing a role in that, any of that behavior. That's the non sequitur. Like, that, that's where we come back to the hardware software, right? So just because so my behavior is, is realized, is grounded in my consciousness to a certain extent, there could be something else that has the same behavior that's grounded in some different non-conscious mechanical stuff. Uh, that's totally consistent. It's just going back to the, I, I'm not sure what Sean's response that was. You know, it just, like the I, Microsoft Word can be grounded in, yeah, you said it's not a good analogy, but I didn't see why. It can be grounded in an iPhone and a desktop. That doesn't mean the iPhone's not doing anything. My, con my behavior can be grounded in consciousness. Something behaving just like me could be grounded in another type of non-conscious stuff. This is what philosophers call multiple realization. And we understand this, and there's you know, considerable works about that. So, um, but the, I mean, the essence of the zombie intuition is just that just that when we talk about consciousness, that's not just claims about behavior, which is essentially, when push comes to shove, that's what the physicalist has to say. You know, when you, because physics is, you know, is, all, is ultimately all about stuff doing stuff. And if that's all there is, as Sean eloquently puts it, you know, redescriptions of stuff doing stuff, then claims about consciousness are just claims about behavior, not just external behavior, but the behavior of the bits inside you. But when I say, you know, my wife's feeling pain, that is not a claim about 
her behavior or the behavior of bits inside of it. It's about how she feels, and that's just a very different kind of claim. So, yeah, just that's what I think you need to think of. When, when, when you're cl making claims about consciousness, are they just claims about behavior or not? That's the fundamental question to work out whether you're a physicalist or not. Sorry, that was a bit, I'll try and make shorter answers. Um, I'm Harry, I'm a divinity student. Uh, first of all, just thank you so much both uh, for your tonight, but also overall your work in doing the supremely humanitarian task of inspiring people to gaze at the stars and within themselves uh, with wonder. Thank you. Um, uh, this question is mostly for Philip, although I'm also eager to hear uh, Sean's rebuttal. Uh, apologies for bringing a question of morality into this empirical debate. Um, but one real moral merit of physicalist conceptions of consciousness is its invitation to view humans as animals, uh, not of any higher order than other animals, as we are all mere resultants of the same reproduction-driven evolutionary process. Panpsychism, on the other hand, seems to in invite a more anthropocentric view. Sure, all matter is conscious, uh, but we must be a more fully actualized or realized consciousness, given that we are here having the debate about consciousness and other forms of consciousness are not. Um, uh, thereby, and, and thus elevating us to a higher order of consciousness than others. Um, in your view, Philip, how can panpsychism avoid such a potentially ecologically problematic conclusion? Um, so I think, you know, I think panpsychism is, is not like dualism. It is not seeing a, a sort of radical difference between um, us and other animals and the rest of the universe. The, this, the, it opens you up to a kind of continuity that a materialist can have as well. You know, that there's, for the panpsychist, there's simpler forms of consciousness and then natural selection molds them into more complicated forms of consciousness over millions of years. So it really is a picture of the world in which we're continuous with the rest of the world. We may be different in, in, in certain ways, but, um, but we're at least continuous. We're you know, conscious creatures in a conscious universe, so there's a real continuity in nature. So it's, I see it as a, you know, a Copernican view in that sense, fundamentally Copernican view. It does sound right to me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put any blame on the pen. That's not the panpsychist mistake. They make other mistakes. <laughs> I guess I guess it's something that's bringing up the problem, the problem of how do not just more combined with others. Ah, a combination problem. Okay, well, um, I'll try not to talk too long. I mean, so this is the big challenge, actually. Bob and Sean's, I don't think Sean's objections are that compelling, but I think, you know, the big challenge is the combination problem, right? How do we make sense of little conscious things combining to make big conscious things? Um, and this is where the time and energies of the Panpsychist Research Program are, are engaged. Um, you know, there are lots of promising proposals. Luke Roloffs, who was supposed to be at this conference and his plane was cancelled, uh, has some really promising proposals rooted in the metaphysics of composition that a lot of good philosophy has been done on. Um, so, so there's a lot of potential. I mean, I, I also think it's important to contrast the time and energy that's gone into addressing the problems of physicalism and addressing the problems of panpsychism. You know, addressing the hard problem of consciousness, a huge amount of time and energy has gone into that. And basically, it's, as I say, it's got nowhere, and people think, you know, it's now long, no longer possible to do it, at least in the way we thought, it, we thought we could do it in the past. There's been very little time and energy. It's just getting going on the combination problem, so... I think it's justifiable to, to need more time. Um, and I think the arguments against the coherence of physicalism that I gave tonight don't really apply to panpsychism either. So even if we don't have the final solution, um, you know, there's no argument that we'll never get there. And just finally, even if there's no solution, even you know, it, could, it could turn out that consciousness is just totally irreducible, like human consciousness is just totally irreducible. Um, but you'd still have the attraction of panpsychism that everything bottoms out in consciousness. We, we, well, the, you've still got that center attraction that physical reality is accounted for in terms of underlying forms of consciousness. And that's the, you know, the real benefit of the theory, that it bottoms out, like materialism or physicalism, it can bottom out in just one kind of stuff. And that's got nothing to do with the combination problem, so you still have that. That's the central appeal. But yeah, lots more to be said on that. Hello? Okay. 
quick question for Sean. Um, if there can be multiple interpretations of the formulas of quantum mechanics and the experiments as well that posit like radically different ontologies, like many worlds or uh, objective chanciness or hidden variables, why couldn't the same be said for there being multiple interpretations of the core theory? One that posits non-conscious entities at a fundamental level and another that posits conscious entities at the, at the fundamental level, but still both using the core theory. Yeah, because in quantum mechanics, calling the different theories interpretations is just an antiquated mistake. Back in the day, in the 1930s, when we didn't understand that much about quantum mechanics, and we said, okay, there's phenomena we observe, we can predict, and we need to interpret how to think about what's going on. And those were the bad old days, and so we debated interpretations. Now we debate honestly different physical theories. Uh, pilot wave theories and many worlds and objective collapse theories are not different interpretations of the same underlying thing. They have different ontologies, different dynamical equations, some, in some cases different predictions. In other cases, I think there are different predictions, we just haven't found them yet. So that goes back to the zombies and the you know, iPhone versus Android an analogy because to make the analogy work, you have to imagine that your iPhone and your Android are atom by atom identical but you're calling this one an iPhone, you're calling that one an Android, and I don't see a difference there. Maybe our last question, so. Uh, hi, this has been great, thank you for your time. Um, so we all have these like rich inner lives and we don't really feel like we have body, or we, we don't feel like we are bodies, we feel like we have bodies, and people have these experiences, religious and psychedelic, that would convince them that our experience can go beyond the physical world, uh, whether it actually does or not. So I'm wondering if we can get to physicalism from more of that first-hand point of view. So I guess for Sean, I'm wondering, do you or can you ever feel like uh, physicalism is true? Because based on reason and logic and the history of empirical science, I think you have a pretty so solid case, but do you ever feel like it's true? And I guess to Philip, if we were to properly value that first person private data, is there any way that that data could possibly take us to physicalism? I think Philip is being even a harder question than I am here. I think my question is easy. Yes. I can feel like physicalism is true. I, I suspect that underneath the question is a suspicion that maybe I can't feel like physicalism is true. Um, it, it, I'm tempted to quote David Lewis as, as saying, you know, I do not know how to refute an incredulous stare. Yes, I, I do actually feel like physicalism is true. And I, and I think that, again, it, there's, there's judgment calls that come in here because we're trying to predict future understandings that we don't yet have. And the thing that is central in my mind is consciousness is really hard to understand. It's the first thing that would be not yet understood, even if we understood everything else, right? It's the, it's the thing you would most expect to struggle with. And, and the fundamental nature of reality is it's bizarre and it's weird that we understand it so well, right? There's, Plenty we don't understand, but that's why it's the 5% of the universe analogy. Like, it's kind of amazing that we understand as much as we do. So I absolutely feel 100% that uh, what I know from my inner private data are compatible with my views about the physical world. I don't know how to make the connections explicitly. I'm not ad admitting that, but I see nothing in my inner experiences or in anyone else's testimony that gives me pause to think that someday we will not understand this physically. To directly answer the question, yeah, of course there's something that could lead us from the first person datum of consciousness to physicalism. If physicalism lived up to its explanatory obligations, solved the hard problem, managed to give some story that rendered intelligible the emergence of subjective qualities from underlying purely quantitative physical processes, and that used to be the aspiration, you know? That used to be what physicalists took themselves to have to do. But they eventually realized, you know, that the, because these are such radically different concepts, the purely quantitative physical science and the qualities of the qualitative nature of conscious experience, that you're not gonna be able to build these expansion bridges. So now most physicalists say, oh, we don't need to do that. We don't need to 
tell the kind of intelligible story that you could tell, for example, about the boiling point of water in terms of underlying chemistry. Um, and, you know, to my mind, that's sort of given up. But if somebody could do that, you know, then, um, yeah, of course, that would be living up to its expansionary obligations. But in the meantime, we've got a theory that's never got, to, got anywhere in that project. There's good reason to think it can't be done. It just, it's just, you know, it's just an incoherent project. And we've got this other theory. We know, we've, we've done it. We've worked out how to fulfill its expansionary obligations. So, and the only reason we go for, you know, we don't make the right choice, it just, you know, feel, it's not how we've come, got used to thinking of science, feels a bit weird, but when you think objectively about these two options, I think my mind is a clear winner, but I might be wrong. Hi. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you for being here. It's, it's truly been such an amazing experience playing my part here. Um, so I was talking to Philip last night about this. So I was just wondering, Sean, what your thoughts were. Um, so I'm just thinking that do you believe there is anything limiting about just looking at the physical science? So do you know? Do you think there's something more than what science can explain? Is there anything really limiting about that? I think that there are. There's two different ways to interpret that question. Um, I think that science is extremely broad. To me, science is just an attempt to understand how the world works by proposing hypotheses and judging them empirically. And empirical data includes inner experiences just as much as it includes public experiences. So do our best to understand the whole world. And that's very, very broad. Qualitative, quantitative, private, public, that's all under the rubric of science. I don't think that various things that are important to human beings can necessarily be reduced to science. I, I think that aesthetic preferences are fundamentally subjective. I think that morals are fundamentally constructed, not objectively out there in the world, not derivable by science. So there's certainly more to the world than science, but in terms of understanding what the world is and how it behaves and how it works, science is the, is the way to go. Yeah. You can give your opinion, Philip. Go ahead. Oh, is there more to... Um, so as I see, my, my, my view is, how do we find out about reality, experiments, and observation? And then I said, and other, there are other data about reality. The most obvious one is um, the reality of consciousness. But I actually think there are other non-scientific data for a theory of reality. I, I think there's a, the reality of value and mathematical entities, which is numbers, the... Um, uh, truths of logic. So, so there are other data, but that's more controversial. I accept uh, that's you know something would be a deeper argument. I think the the you know what's interesting about consciousness is it's it's so hard to deny the data. But you know it's 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 much more of a battle. You know, do we do we have to take the reality of value as a basic datum or mathematical entities or something? There's a much bit. But anyway, but yeah, I think I think there are many that there are at least those four things. That a, that a theory of reality has to accommodate. So, oh yeah, so, so I definitely think it, it's, 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 we have to re remem relearn the importance of philosophy, basically. As I say, I think we've gone through this period of history where that limited project of accounting for observation experiments has gone really well, so we think, that's it, that's everything, it really works well, and I understand that, you know, it seems more tractable and it creates technology, and, but at the end of the day, there are other ways of knowing about reality, and the job of philosophy, I see, is one of synthesis, of taking these different things we know about reality in different ways, and we can have an argument about what those are, and synthesizing them into a single, simple, unified theory of reality, and panpsychism looks to be a good way to do that. Which okay, and with that, let's thank our speakers. Thank you.